Thanks everybody for joining uh, today's webinar with Bytespeed to discuss how to leverage E-rate funding for your school and how Ruckus Networks can help. My name is Aaron Kobernick and I am the Ruckus Solution Specialist here at Bytespeed. And I just wanted to mention really quick about Bytespeed. And then after this session, I'll send out some links in a follow-up email. Um, Bytespeed was founded in 1999 um, in Moorhead, Minnesota, but we do operate nationwide, uh, primarily in, in K through 12 and, and some higher education and some uh, commercial. Uh, Bytespeed has been an elite Ruckus partner for nearly two decades with hundreds of, of uh, successful deployments. And we have engineering teams that can help, uh, you know, set up a network consult with you or, or help register for Ruckus demos or for proof of concepts and trials. Um, we've also developed an e-rate guide to help answer some of your questions and help get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, today, we're joined with uh, Jim Kerr of E-Rate ProfitWorks and with Jatan Gori of Ruckus Networks. Um, and then if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to enter them into the chat and we'll discuss them all at the end uh, during the Q&A section. Um, so Jim, uh, go ahead, introduce yourself, and then let us know about E-Rate. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning. Share my screen here. So um, my name is Jim Kerr, and uh, I am a founder and owner of E-Rate ProfitWorks, and KB and Associates is the corporate name. We are a service provider and manufacturer consultant. So I'm preface this conversation with um, the fact that uh, I can't help you with your E-rate processes. All I can do is lay out rules of the road and let you know what um, my perspective is on the E-rate process. Um, we are here not to help you file any documentation or take the place of any consulting firm or USAC in any capacity. Um, I report to uh, the folks at uh, at bite speed and that's that's my role and I'm to help them. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, I guess is the operative word. Um, what I'm here to do is discuss a little bit of the highlights of E-Rate. I'm sure that uh, you're familiar with the program. Um, and I'm, what I'm gonna do as we go through this is just highlight some of the um, hot topics I think that are going around right now and how they may impact you. Um, the first one is what are the funding categories? And uh, this is brand new as of within the last couple of weeks or the last year. Um, and under category one, um, the public notice that was issued, as well as the declaratory ruling that the FCC just issued, allowed for cellular data, for mobile cellular data to be eligible under E-rate. That is um, how they're going about putting bus, our school bus Wi-Fi in place under E-rate. And we'll discuss that a little bit more in the, at a, another slide. And then we have fixed wireless was eligible or made eligible in 2023 for those locations where you cannot get uh, fiber or some sort of ISP service into a location and you want to distribute uh, your network um, wider. Um, category two hasn't changed. We're going to go into each one of these subcategories here in the next couple of slides. Uh, as you may well know, um, the, the primary thing we're discussing today for Ruckus Wireless is eligible under internal connections, and you have a Category 2 budget. Um, you can spend it how you see fit under any one of those three legs of the Category 2 stool, the internal connections, basic maintenance, or manage internal broadband services. Um, here's an example of a school district with 1,000 students just for the ease of um, disseminating the information. Um, for libraries, that's $4.50 per square foot over the five-year pre-discount period. And again, that's $167 per student for five years um, pre-discount. So this district elected to spend the money in this fashion, you know, $50,000, $20,000, $40,000, 40000 and 10000 in the final year. Um, note that 2025 is the last year of this cycle of budget, and then we'll see a new cycle budget starting in 2026 funding year. Um, small school districts in 2021 got a floor of $25,000 for small sites, up to 10 sites um, in the district. That's so it's relatively smaller districts actually have up to a $250,000 budget if their student population is relatively small compared to each site. The eligible services list for category two hasn't changed as of today. We expect the category two, or excuse me, the uh, eligible services list to be announced sometime in December. 
Um, a couple of things are competing interests and processes that may delay that. And so uh, Jim Kerr's crystal ball on timing uh, may be that the window gets pushed out this year somewhat. Don't bet on it, plan, don't plan for it. Begin to plan and issue form 470s as early as possible in the process. But um, we think that the window may be delayed because of what's happening with the FCC right now. Um, notes, virtualization um, and equipment that um, combines eligible functions is eligible under category two. And then a multi-year warranty, as long as it's not a separately identifiable price is eligible with the components. So if you have a switch and that switch has a built-in warranty associated with it, and there's not a separately or discernible difference in price, then it's eligible under internal connections. And then management software is eligible under managed internal broadband services. So um, Ruckus Analytics, as an example, is eligible under managed internal broadband services. So one of the things that we see that's the biggest gotcha in E-rate applications from our client's perspective is things get misfiled under the wrong category of service. And this is um, through no fault of your own. The, um, the provider may um, give you a long laundry list of bill of materials and buried in there is a support SKU as an example. And it just automatically goes into internal connections where it should actually be under basic maintenance of internal connections. Or a, um, RA, a standalone RA SKU gets into a, the mix and it, where in fact it should be under managed internal broadband services. So we see a lot of that and it really delays the application process. And we'll talk about that more later and how to fix it. But suffice it to say, making sure that the right category of service is um, um, applied for is absolutely critical. So under basic maintenance, this is really, un they made it really confusing, unfortunately. Basic maintenance, there's three main categories for break fit, what I call break fix. So repair and upkeep of eligible hardware, wire and cable maintenance, and configuration changes all fall under the break fix category. And the way you figure that out is you take an estimate of annual services requirements for those three things and say, we estimate that it's gonna cost X number of dollars. And then as an incident occurs, a trouble ticket gets issued and a, a technician is dispatched to fix something, an access point goes down or something like that. At that point in time, you would bill for just that particular incident against the amount of money. So it's a time and material situation. The other you know, piece of that is for basic technical support. These are your manufacturer support SKUs. For basic technical online and telephone support, software upgrades, patches, and bug fixes and security updates. Note that there is no advanced hardware replacement in there. There's no break fix in there. These are just automated things that typically fall under our manufacturer support SKU. Again, those are one-time costs and can be um, um, applied for as a one-time cost, but it sure is, it needs to fall under basic maintenance of internal connections, not under internal connections. And then we have this new category of service starting a couple of year, few years ago called managed internal broadband services. This is where um, we, we think that there's a real opportunity for you as the applicant to gain some real good services that you may not otherwise have availability for or may not be able to afford. This is where you start to outsource the network administration of your network. And that's you know, from a day-to-day -day care and feeding of the network. So it's for operation management and monitoring of the network and the eligible components on the eligible services list. And you can either rent, lease, or own the gear. So literally, Bytespeed could come to you and say, hey, listen, I see that you want to uh, do managed internal broadband services for a network refresh. Single line item on the application that says, here's the total cost per year of that network. And it's on a lease basis. And you make one payment for the management operation ownership and monitoring of that network. It doesn't include break fix. That's under basic maintenance. Oh, and it doesn't include support, that's under basic maintenance, but everything else can be done under managed internal broadband services. It's, um, we think it's a unique opportunity and one that you can, that sure the government's gonna pay for and it's, that's a good thing. So I'll leave it at that. Um, so making sure 
that you are asking for the correct thing under the correct category of service is absolutely critical to a timely uh, funding commitment decision letter. And so basic maintenance, um, it, the brake fix and the maintenance of the equipment, and then the manufacturer's support not including brake fix or you know advanced hardware replacement kinds of things, and then reconfiguration of your networks are eligible under basic maintenance of internal connections. Everything else is eligible under internal connections. So hardware, software, monitoring, management, and operation under managed internal broadband services, and then just the acquisition component of internal connections is the hardware, software, licensing, installation, and training. So again, um, making sure that you do that correctly is absolutely critical. What does your application process look like? Um, I've seen the uh, process flow um, worksheet from uh, USAC. Um, this is my own, but so during the uh, during the budget cycle, you start to figure out your needs assessment and determine if you have budget to pay for it. And then you um, look at the eligible services list and components on the eligible services list, and then you file your form 470. Typically, the application window is announced sometime in December or late. It's supposed to be actually um, 60 days prior to the window opening, but they consistently waive that rule and announce it about 30 days before it actually opens. So um, Form 470 and RFP if required or filed, um, and then your um, service par provider partner um, submits their proposals to you, and then you revise your student data, um, conduct a fair, open, and competitive process with price being the most heavily weighted factor in your evaluation criteria for eligible services. You select Lightspeed, and at that point in time, you sign a contract with them. Uh, file your Form 471, and then making sure that you review the receipt acknowledgement letter and the actual Form 471 with your partner, service provider. Um, this is a critical step. Now is the time at that point in time when any corrections to the application can be made fairly easily. Submit a RAL correction along with the application and then that correction will flow through with the application. The minute that the reviewer has to stop and issue a 15 day letter, it's an automatic 45 day delay in the process because what happens is they issue the 15 day letter and you respond to the 15 day letter. That response gets noted, but it doesn't get touched until such time as that application bubbles back through from the bottom of the pile up to the top of the pile for that particular reviewer, and then it gets touched. So again, making sure that uh, you get these uh, any issues resolved early on in the process is vital to a funding commitment decision letter in a timely manner. So funding commitment decision letter or FCDL is issued. Typically, if you're a public sector, you would issue a purchase order for the acquisition at that point in time. A form 486 should be filed and then your service provider partner can begin to install the service and deliver the service. Um, and at that point in time, then you have the bear or spy invoice method, build entity application for reimbursement bear, where you pay up front and then seek reimbursement or spy service provider invoicing. And I'll discuss a kind of subtleties to those two uh, versions in a later slide. <clears throat> so for best practices, um, my recommendation is to apply for all three subcategories. Um, this way, if there's any issues, geez, I really intended for that to be basic maintenance and internal connections, uh, as opposed to, or a SKU that which should have been basic maintenance, got included in internal connections. Um, at that point in time, if you apply for basic maintenance of internal connections for that particular component, it's very simple for the reviewer to create a new FRN under basic maintenance of internal connections and move that particular line item into basic maintenance of internal connections. If you didn't apply for basic maintenance of internal connections, then it's not fixable and you're going to have to come out of pocket for that. And that's never a happy discussion between you and your service provider. Um, so again, applying for all three is absolutely um, critical to success, in my opinion, to a successful application process. Next is make sure that the E-rate terms and conditions work for your situation. And this goes back to bear and spy invoicing in particular. Uh, if you say, I will only accept, uh, or this will only be 
um, contractually uh, obligated under a funding commitment decision letter and under support from USAC, it locks you into waiting for your funding commitment decision letter. If you allow for bear and spy invoicing in your contract, as an example, and you say, we can begin whenever we pull the trigger on this process, you have the ability to do that, but you lock yourself into certain terms and conditions early on in the process as far as subject to funding commitment decision letter. That means you're going to be waiting until it gets funded before you can even begin the process. Um, and if, you, if you're pretty confident that you're going to get funded, uh, why wait as, an, as one example or one question? And, and if you have the budget to pay for it. And there's also a way to pay for this partially. Um, let's say that you have a um, you expe expect the funding commitment decision letter to be coming shortly and you want to get started and you have the flexibility with the terms and conditions to do so, then you know work with your service provider partner to say, hey, you know we'd like to pay, um, we want to begin the process. We're going to pay our percentage and then we expect the funding commitment decision letter to come through shortly. Um, we know we're in final review as an example, or it's wave ready. Get started. And then once the funding commitment decision letter comes through in the next week or so, then you can go ahead and get started ahead of time. Um, support renewal should be done under build entity application for reimbursement. And the reason I say that is, is if you don't do it under build entity uh, application for reimbursement or bear, uh, let's say that your support renewal um, expires July 1 or June 30th, and you need the E-rate to pay for the uh, new support renewal. Well, if you've um, limited yourself, again, contractually, then you have to wait for your funding commitment decision letter. Meantime, the support renewal isn't paid for. So allowing for bare um, uh, payments on your uh, contract for support SKUs, as an example, is important because you want that renewal to occur when it's due. Um, use Make sure that you're using manufacturer model number and SKU numbers and they're accurate. Um, We've seen places where those are not, not exact. And what happens is the reviewer looks at these SKUs and actually goes and does their homework on each, every single line item. And if it doesn't match the SKUs that's in the database that's support, supplied by the manufacturer, they're gonna come back to a guy like me or somebody in, some, in one of the manufacturer's organizations and go, hey, is this E-rate eligible? I'm gonna look at that number and say, it doesn't appear anywhere. I have no idea where that came from. And they're going to go uh, let's halt the process and then go figure it out where it came from and what the eligibility percentage is and all those kinds of things. And that takes many, many, many days. Um, your application is then in limbo for a considerable period of time. Um, for basic maintenance on internal connection, multi years, um, where you get a, a five year SKU for support, as an example. Well, you have to apply for a portion or the five-year portion, so 20% per year of the eligible component. Um, and you, the, the manufacturers and, um, and service providers are typically not willing to um, delay payment for things that they have to pay for out of pocket for five years, period. So um, plan on paying for it up front and then applying for a percentage of it each year over the five-year period or three-year period, whatever that is. Um, usually there's a cost uh, advantage to doing that on multi-years that make up for the difference and having to come out of pocket, but just be aware of that. Um, and then making sure that your service provider partner is adhering to lowest corresponding price, that's upon them, not you. Make sure to require the service provider to submit a bulk upload template with each category of service proposed. Um, that should be as part of you know, part of the narrative at the very minimum on your form 470, hey, submit a full bulk upload template. That is the easy button for you guys as you apply for your form 471s or your or your consultant. Um, make sure that basic maintenance, this do, does not apply to that time and materials break, fix, and reconfiguration and MIBS line items. So basic maintenance on internal connections for manufacturer support cues, SKUs and MIBS line items are submitted as one-time costs and not monthly costs. Um, that way it's, it's simple, it simplifies everybody's life in, down the road. Um, document retention is critical. There is a 10 year requirement for document retention of everything related to an E-rate process. As the applicant, you're required to retain all, app or all proposal submittals from the service provider community um, as part of that component. So you have even more to store, if you will, than the service provider does. 
And then minimize redundancy and high availability in your applications. Redundancy is not E-rate eligible. We see this often where there are redundant um, CP or excuse me, redundant uh, power supplies and switches as an example. It is eligible if it's required for the full functionality of that component, i.e. I can't fully configure PoE without the second power supply as an example sometimes. Um, that is eligible, but where it's for high availability or reliability issues, it is not eligible. So again, bidding process and some of the best practices for bidding, um, it must be fair, open and competitive. Uh, it is not acceptable if your service provider or the manufacturer gives you their magic RFP and says, here, use this. Um, manufacturers have some flexibility if they don't have a spin to provide you with some engineering, but your service provider partner should not be giving you a bill of materials, which you then turn into your RFP document. Um, that is su supporting you in the 470 RFP process, not a good idea. And you're supposed to use the words equivalent, equal, or compatible in all documentation. So if you say, um, or equivalent on the Form 470, but your RFP says you'll only buy this, that is not exactly a um, good idea. You should be saying or equivalent in your RFP document as an example. Um, if you do sp specify a product in an RFP or a Form 470 and the words equivalent, equal, or compatible are in there, then you must review the equivalency if, it, if there's an equivalent product submitted. Now, compatible is a different issue. Let's say that you have a ruckus network and you are adding 20 access points to that network. You can require compatibility. In other words, it must interoperate seamlessly within the network. Um, that's compatibility, uh, i.e. somebody else manufactures access point is not going to operate seamlessly in that network and you're not required to buy it. It, is, it. it may be an equivalent product, but it's not compatible. So making sure that you understand that subtlety is, is important in your process. You are required to have enough specificity in the Form 470 for your service providers to bid or else you're supposed to have an RFP. Now there's a narrative in there that you can put a lot of information in and it can suffice as an RFP. There's a lot of room for a lot of narrative in there and you can add a lot of um, information in there that should give you enough flexibility. But again, your local and state local procurement laws may require you to have an RFP if it's a, over a certain dollar value or for certain types of acquisitions. Um, we recommend having an RFP and, and particularly in larger acquisitions, it's very helpful. Uh, you're supposed to answer technical questions. Um, I tell my um, service provider clients that technical questions are technical questions. So if you get how many um, concurrent sessions do you need on this firewall or what is the um, um, capacity of your current internet service provider pipe um, for a firewall? Those are technical questions and you're required to answer them. If you get, hi, I'm with so-and-so and we have the best product known to mankind for this particular application and we have hundreds of technical support personnel and we're big, bad, and beautiful, um, hey, please um, tell us how many concurrent sessions you need. That is not a technical question. That's a sales call with a technical question buried in there. You're not required to answer it. So pure technical questions, you are required to answer. Um, and then you're supposed to document the selection process with some sort of a bid score sheet and where price is the most heavily weighted factor considering only eligible services. This is a USAC example. This is right off of their website. Um, it's a little bit ago. I think they have some newer ones, but here's an example of that bid score matrix. Uh, feel free to uh, copy and paste this or screenshot it. Um, and there you go. Um, gift rules, $20 in any single transaction from ByteSpeed to you and $50 in any single year from ByteSpeeds. So just make sure you're not exceeding $20 in any single transaction um, where anything of value is exchanged. Again, you know, you go to a um, lunch and learn and they're serving, um, you know, a, a sandwich and some Cokes or something like that. That's not a violation. Um, that's less than 20 bucks and doesn't count. But you go out to lunch and it's a nice lunch, no more than $20 per person. Demos and evals um, are proof of concepts. If you have hardware or software and you're utilizing it as a demo or an eval, um, there is a, a statute of limitations, if you will, um, on that. 
after about 90 to 120 days, you're going to start to get scrutiny if it becomes um, public knowledge that that's what's going on. Um, certainly not more than six months. That's outside the bounds of good taste. Um, and during the 470 process, it's 15 days. So if you have proof of concept demo eval gear on site, and it has anything to do with the service provider or manufacturer you're considering for an E-rate process, make sure it's gone within 15 days of the time you issue your Form 470. Otherwise, you're in a competitive bidding violation. The above where it sits longer than, you know, I'm saying 120 days, that becomes a gift rule violation. So um, that's just be aware that competitive bidding violation is during the 470 window process. Some latest news and updates. Um, there's a notice of proposed rulemaking making that has been floating around what's called an MPRM regarding an E-rate bidding portal. Um, it hasn't gained any traction. We haven't seen any news on it in a couple of years, but it's floating around out there. We think it's a really bad idea. Um, others think so as well. So we'll see what happens there. Um, there, there's a move to make cybersecurity 100% E-rate eligible. We think that this is going to take the form of a trial um, in the near term. We think it's going to happen soon. I would think that they're going to announce it and there's going to be some sort of trial process that's going to be outside of E-rate. Uh, how it's going to actually fall out, we don't know, but we have heard that it's going to be $200 million over a three-year pilot. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, there's a lot of MIBS activity, as I alluded to earlier. We've seen huge growth in that. We think it's a neat opportunity um, for you to take advantage of. Um, funding year 2024 is year four of a five-year cycle. 2025 is use it or lose it. So uh, if you have Category 2 budget remaining, sure recommend you figure out and plan for how you're going to spend it over the next two years. And then there's a notice of proposed rulemaking to make Wi-Fi hotspots E-rate eligible as of yesterday. Um, we think this is one of the reasons we think there might be a delay in the uh, 471 window and the uh, eligible services list process. Um, this has comments due in 30 days. It was issued yesterday, so December 8th. And then um, we get into the Christmas rush because we get to the 23rd in 45 days. So it's, um, uh, it's not looking likely that this is going to get done in conjunction with a normal E-rate timeline. So that's one of the reasons I say, I think there may be a delay in the process. And then school buses are the other pending issue. Um, there was a notice of, uh, actually there was a public notice and then what's called the declaratory ruling. So back on the 25th, um, well, just prior to the 25th, on the 19th of last month, they issued what's called the declaratory ruling. And they said, school bus Wi-Fi is eligible under E-rate. It's full stop. The public notice requests comments and is notice, uh, noticing us on how they intend to, or potentially intend to go about doing this. Um, the comments are due on the 24th of this month. <clears throat> We're working along in, or in conjunction with some other organizations to do a reply comment on what our thoughts are, but um, we, think that it's going to go down as category one and potentially category two service. So it may hit your category two budget. Start thinking about that. Um, we, uh, the new rules will be, we think issued in December and the 471 window opens December, January or 470 window for this. Cause it's obviously if they open it up as category two and category one, there's going to need to be some changes to the drop down menus in category one and category two in the form 470 application. Again, it's gonna be eligible in the 2024 funding year. That's about all we know that's concrete. We have a whole bunch of other questions that are still outstanding. Is there a cap on dollar amount on an annual basis? They talked about $1,840. Are leased buses eligible? We think so because there's precedence for leased buildings. In other words, unowned buildings to have E-rate um, eligible services embedded in them or actually attached to them a la cabling infrastructure in a leased building is eligible. Um, so we think there's precedent for a lot of this and we'll see what happens and how it washes out. We'll know more later. Um, watch this space is all I can say. And with that, I'm going to wrap. 
Um, my contact information, again, I can't help you with anything, but if uh, somebody doesn't like what I had to say, please feel free to reach out and hope you all have a great day. Awesome. Thanks for all that, Jim. That was uh, definitely a ton of helpful information. Um, so, so next up, what we've got is uh, we're going to talk with uh, Jatan Gori of uh, Ruckus Networks. Uh, Jatan, are you are you ready? Did you get your laptop on? Uh, yeah, I think we're good to go here. Let me uh, find my uh, second here. I don't see it up quite yet. What now? Anything? No, not yet. I, I do see we did get a couple questions. Uh, we'll just save those for the end um, for the people that place those. So if you have more questions, feel free to add them to the to the list if you need. So I can I can see you, Jatan, but I'm not seeing your screen. Not letting me uh, add. What about now? Uh, a little bit. I can see what looks to be the Lion King, maybe. Okay, yep. That's a good start. How about now? Now I can see uh, your Dropbox right. screen. Can you see the, uh, the, the, the page? Yep, it's talking about uh, organizations okay. that trust Ruckus. Okay. Perfect. All right. So let me, uh, let me start there. Perfect. Hey guys. Uh, any questions that that we need to cover before I dive in here at all? Or no, uh, there's there's a couple that popped up, but we'll just save them for the end. That way, we can just kind of flow through them. Okay, yeah. I mean, if if you, if people would rather do that, but somebody may need to leave, or who knows what. Uh, but yeah, that's that's fine. I, I I'm I'm good with that. Okay. All right. Uh, so hey, uh, thanks for joining everyone. I appreciate everyone joining. Um, you know, as you you guys may or may not have heard of Ruckus, so my thought is to let me just give you a brief overview of kind of who Ruckus is and what makes us a little unique in this whole space. Um, so uh, so first of all, Ruckus has been around since 2010. We started off as a wireless only company. We um, that was sort of our claim to fame, really making high quality, uh, high performing Wi-Fi. Um, you know, all of the, the two smart guys who started Ruckus, that was their main focus. Uh, you fast forward to today, uh, we are part of a company and we merged with Brocade back in 2016, uh, which if you guys know is a was a switched manufacturer. Prior to that was Foundry Networks. Uh, so all of that portfolio is now bundled into the Ruckus portfolio. So when you talk about Ruckus today, we're an end-to-end -end networking company, everything from wireless to switches to um IoT and and you know AI uh, cloud AI converged platforms and so on. So um, so that's kind of who Ruckus is today. So why am I showing this slide? This is just to give you an idea of uh, you know the the breadth of what what Ruckus does and and who some of our customers are. Uh, everything from uh, Google who uses uh, Ruckus in these hot spots that you can see the little kiosks um, in New York City, London, and and pretty soon they're going to do this project in Philadelphia. Uh, they put a hotspot in each of these um, a little uh, kiosks so that you as a tourist, you know, a, a, in one of these cities can actually go up to it and figure out what's happening. You can connect to the hotspot and, and have, you know, uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi throughout the city. So um, the goal of, of this project was to make sure that whatever AP they used in there could handle at least 200 simultaneous connections. And when they, they tested APs from different vendors, they found that Ruckus really was the only one who could even come close. In fact, we, we, we exceeded their expectations uh, in that area. So, um, so we've sold over 10,000 APs just for this one project. Um, the other thing to point out here is, um, is Marriott uh, and basically the hospitality industry in general. And the reason I bring that up is because 
uh, when you think about a hotel or, or any sort of a venue, convention center, large public venue, uh, th their biggest issue is um, that they can't control what devices get on their network. Uh, in, in the case of a school, uh, you may have a BYOD program where you've told folks and guests that come into your school, parents, whatever, hey, you can bring in you know, whatever you, you want. You'll be able to get on the network. Uh, so it's a little more challenging for you as as a tech director, network administrator, to um, to to figure out how do I you know uh, make sure that the that, that the the network that we have performs really well, that everyone has a good experience, right? So uh, it's a challenge in, in a in a corporate environment. They can tie everything down and limit what gets on the network. So that's why I point this out because in a hotel, if the Wi-Fi doesn't work, um, and time and time again you go to the same hotel and you have a problem you're probably not going to go back, right? So um, that's why the fact that, you know, they pick ruckus 80% of the times in these uh, in the hospitality space just means that we deliver that high-performing, you know, um, uh, Wi-Fi that's really reliable. So uh, just a couple things to note over there. Uh, our big thing is let's, let's look at the connection between the device and the AP. Let's try to make that connection like a wired connection, right? That's really what our focus has been throughout um, whereas most of the competitors will, if you open a competitor's AP, you won't even know whether it's one competitor or the other. They all look the same because they basically get the reference board from overseas. They slap it in a case and put their software on it, firmware, whatever, and call it good. Uh, Ruckus is different in that regard. So I'll get into that here in a second. So what is uh, what does a portfolio look like? Uh, overall, I talked about Wi-Fi. I mentioned switches. Uh, the, the heritage of Ruckus switches comes from Brocade. Uh, and Foundry, um, we, we do everything from uh, a very cost-effective edge switch, which you would connect for, you know, whether it's IP cameras or access points or digital signage, door locks, things like that, um, uh, all the way, you know, that provide PoE and also multi-gig. So if you're looking for, um, you know, uh, higher higher um, than one gig PoE, uh, higher, higher than one gig capacity, rather, uh, we do have two and a half, five and 10 gig proper uh, switches too that you can connect to a lot of the newer APs that have those higher ports. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is uh, the PoE budgets. So we do offer multi-gig switches that have a higher PoE than higher than 30 watts, So we can go all the way to 90 watts. So some of these switches are even used to power like um, digital signage that's up to 80 inches. So big screen TVs, things like that, that are PoE enabled that you may want to use. It's, e it's much easier to run uh, low voltage cable to these um, the places that you want to throw up some TVs or signage uh, than it is to, to you know to run high voltage right because then, then you got to have a electrician come in and do all of that so um, so if you have a switch that's capable of that it makes your job a lot easier um, so any everything from edge to core um, going up one notch to the control and management piece of it uh, this is another area where you really want to pay attention uh, when you when you're doing a refresh. You know, do I want something on prem? Uh, and if it's on prem, do I want it to be a physical controller, right? Uh, or do I want it to be a virtualized controller? For instance, if you're running VMware or Hyper V or something like that, um, would you rather have a uh, controller for your switches and your APs in, in, you know, in that environment? Because then you already have the redundancy already built in, right? So, um, I, but if you don't want something on prem, you want something in the cloud. Because uh, everything's moving to the cloud uh, and you'd rather have it that way so you can have a remote app on your phone that you can manage stuff remotely, makes it very easy. Um, we offer that as well. So whether you would need a physical controller, uh, by the way, the physical controller we have will do up to 2,000 access points with a single controller. Uh, you can cluster them and, and get higher than that as well. Uh, the, the, the virtual one um, can go up to 10,000 access points. It depends on which uh, version you spin up, it's the same cost, but it's de it depends on wh whether you want it to be more of a um, high scale type of deal or just essentials, which would be your uh, you know single single um, environment type situation there. Uh, so depending on what you want to do, either a thousand or ten thousand APs uh, in in the virtual, uh, and then of course with Ruckus Cloud, that is our new converged cloud. So what do I mean when I say converged? Right, uh, a lot of people. So today, you know, prior to about a year ago. Our cloud only managed the switches on the APs, and and really that was the, the sole purpose of our cloud management. Uh, however, today we've added in our analytics, um, which is based on AI, which is the stuff you see right above there. It says network intelligence. That's being rolled uh, into the Ruckus cloud. We also have what's called Cloud Path, which is on the top left, um, 
So what is CloudPath? That is a profile-based secure onboarding solution. So it's a way to onboard your devices uh, and by depending on who the individual is. So if you have a student coming in, uh, you can set this up so that the student can can log in and, and when they first see the screen, it'll say, you know, are you a student, teacher, you know, administrator, guest, right? Maybe you have four different profiles. Uh, they, they select student and then it says, is it your own device or is it a school issued device? They pick one or the other. And then uh, what, what happens next is essentially a certificate gets put on their device, right? For X number of, of uh, hours or days or whatever. So if it's a if it's a school issued device, you may want that certificate for the whole year. Now that device is uh, whenever it's in the uh, you know uh, turned up in the in the network, it just connects and everything's good, right? But what happens if uh, if it's a BYOD device and the kid leaves? Let's say they they move to a different school or or whatever, you know, maybe it's an employee and they leave. You can revoke the certificate. Now they can't get on your network when they come back, right? So it, it makes it very, um, uh, it, it, it actually it's much more secure than having a WPA2 type password. Most most schools are struggling with this. So CloudPath helps uh, eliminate those issues where a password is given out, oh, somebody left, I got to change the password, right? Or maybe, uh, the, you know, the neighboring uh, houses and everyone that connect that are in uh, hearing distance of your Wi-Fi can know the password and they're getting on your Wi-Fi. You really don't want that. So. Um, this eliminates all the password issues. So that's all rolled into uh, to Ruckus uh, One, which is our, our new cloud. And then the last two, I'm not really gonna talk about too much here. That's a controller list called Ruckus Unleashed. Some small schools will use Ruckus Unleashed, uh, but that's really designed for uh, you know small to medium business. All right, so uh, what do we do? So what is, what is it that makes Ruckus different? Right, so th this is this is so people always ask me, uh, you know, isn't an AP just an AP? Everybody's just the same. You know, it's it's what you do with the AP and what the interface looks like and and what the features are on the software side that makes one better than the other. Uh, so there's some uh, truth to that part. Of course, you do need all of those other things. However, if you don't have a really strong connection with your devices and you don't focus on that at all. Uh, then you know you you could be opening yourself up to uh, you know issues down the road. So what what the two smart guys who started Ruckus, their thought process was: listen, how can we take radio frequency and how can we direct this better, right? Because if you can if you can direct radio frequency better, you're going to have cleaner air. You're going to have uh, RF that's only going in the direction where it needs to go, right? So that way you're not having you're not blasting in every single direction and then causing more co-channel interference. And high density environments, that's the biggest issue. So the, the FCC says, you know, if I'm an AP and I can hear another AP that's on the same channel, what do I have to do? I have to be polite, meaning I can't talk if he's talking, right? So think about this. You've got a typically uh, an AP in every classroom. You got classrooms above, you got potentially classrooms below. Uh, now that AP uh, that may be on channel, maybe you have, you know, six to eight non overlapping channels, but every, you know, Six to seven channel now is going to be you know on the same channel, right? You can't you know you can't get really around that even on five gigahertz. So what happens is uh, you know when all these classes are in session, they're all going to see, see a lot of buffering going on if they can all hear each other. So really, what you want to do is reduce co-channel interference. So this is another thing that that we think about when we com we uh, came up with the design of this um, this AP. It's called Beamflex. So how does Beamflex work? Um, a good analogy I give to people is, listen, if you've got, you know, uh, two ears to listen with, you know, you can close one ear, but you can still hear sound. So what's the purpose of the second ear? If you think about that, it's directionality of sound, right? So if someone's talking to you from the right side, that audio wave is going to hit your right ear a little bit before it hits your left ear. The brain then processes that and says, okay, the, the sound came from my right, right? Same type of thing here. So instead of a single antenna element, Everybody else in the industry has a single antenna element. You open it up, that's what you're going to find. It's like a light bulb, shoots the signal in every direction. Ruckus is different. We put multiple antenna elements. In this case, it just happens to be 19. Uh, but what do we do? We, um, If you talk to a Ruckus AP from the right side, your um, response from your device is going to hit the elements closest to that device, right? And then what's going to happen next? We're going to turn on the elements closest to where we heard you and send a directional signal towards where we heard you. And, and the response. And now if you move to a different area, we do the same thing on a packet by packet basis. So what does that mean for you as a device? As a device, you're gonna see a stronger signal from a Ruckus AP. Just think of it as more like a flashlight rather than a light bulb, 
it's taking that energy and sending in one direction. It's going to go further. So that's faster data rates because we're, we're seeing a stronger signal, but also higher capacity. This is the, the big issue in schools. How do I handle 30, 40, 50 simultaneous video streams, right? Things like that. Uh, that's really where this comes in. How does Wi-Fi work? It's it's a round robin, half duplex technology. I can't talk to everybody at the same time, right? It's one by one. So what if I can talk to you and finish the conversation quicker than anybody else because I'm giving you a directional signal, right? It's uh, finishing that conversation quicker so I can move on to the next device. So in the same slice of time, I can handle 50, 60, even 70 video streams, no problem, right? Most of our competitors can't do that. They won't even try Right. So so that's the advantage of ruckus. We can do more with less. Typically, you'll find you don't need as many ruckus APs in your school. Uh, we can get away with uh, 30 to 40 percent fewer access points. Right. Fewer actually is better because there's, then le there's less co-channel and appearance as well. So that's in a nutshell what we do. I'm not going to go through all these different slides. However, I will stop at this one. Hang on here if I can get to it. So typically what I tell folks is, listen, you know, you can you can go if you just replace APs one for one, uh, you know, it, it could work. But generally, what I say is use your 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 partner. In this case, it's Bytespeed, right? Uh, use them to do a design for you. Give them your, your building and do all as well before any E-rate, right? You want to shoot it over to them and say, hey, what, what would your design look like for this? Uh, basically, to do a predictive heat map. Right. And you're going to find that uh, if they use ruckus and, and they do, um, you're going to find that the, the the prediction is going to come in a lot less. Uh, that means fewer APs, better uh, Wi-Fi and you're know, saying better switch ports. Right. Overall cost uh, cost of ownership is going to be a lot less with ruckus. And we'll give you better Wi-Fi while doing that. All right. So this was a third party test. If you guys want to see any of this information, I'll shoot it over. Just have Aaron send it to you. Uh, Aaron, maybe in your follow-up, you can send this. Uh, I know we're running towards the end of time, so I don't want to get into this packet six test necessarily, but it's a third-party test that sort of validates everything I told you with the, uh, you know, with uh, video and and data and also the analytics uh, platform. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is the. Um, these are our APs. So today we have uh, Wi-Fi six access points. Um, I want to make a quick announcement. We do have a Wi-Fi 7 access point that we've just announced. Uh, and if you haven't heard of, if somebody actually has a, a Pixel 8, a Google Pixel 8 phone, uh, that actually does have a Wi-Fi 7 client. So the clients are already starting to come out, right? So um, we're going to be the first enterprise access point that's going to ship. So if you're thinking about doing an E-rate thing for sometime next summer, just know that there's going to be Wi-Fi 7 available. So uh, you may want to consider that um, Wi-Fi 7 brings in a lot of cool new innovation um, that uh, maybe we can have a separate talk. If you want to know more about Wi-Fi 7, you can look it up or you can get a hold of um, Aaron and we can do a separate webinar and just dive into Wi-Fi 7 and tell you what that's going to bring to the table. But uh, trust me, it, it's a quantum leap over Wi-Fi 6. There's a lot of really cool new features. So if you're, if you're going to do a whole new refresh, uh, think about Wi-Fi 7 as a possibility. Uh, if you're going to do that, though, you do want to look at your switch network. You want to make sure you have switches that are capable of at least two and a half gig at the edge and at least 30 plus watts of PoE. Uh, I'd say pre preferably 60 watts, you know, if not 90. OK. And then the last thing I'm going to say is uh, make sure that you consider your cable uh, when you have, um, you know, all these different APs and, and that use more power, that use uh, more more data, more bandwidth. Uh, you're going to need cabling that can support all that. So uh, a standard CAT5 cable is just not going to cut it. You want to go to CAT6 or 6A, preferably 6A. At least to your APs, you want to do 6A. Uh, if you want to send it to, uh, you know, cameras, anything else, you could use 6 or even CAT5E, right? Um, so ju just a, a little caveat there. On the switch side, um, uh, you know, start there. I would say look at your switch network. If you only have older switches, that may be a place you want to start. Uh, because there's no point in connecting a, a very high-end access point to a an old switch that doesn't give it enough power and, or bandwidth, right? You're going you're gonna to really not get the most out of that AP. So uh, just, just some things to consider. If you guys want to do a consult with Ruckus or Bytespeed, um, get a hold of Aaron, um, and you know there'll be a follow-up email with his contact information. Uh, we would be happy to help you with that. And uh, with that, I'm going to just end it right here. See if you have any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Jatan. Yep. Um, 
yeah, I do still, we, we just have a couple more questions. I just wanted to go over a couple things quick. Um, uh, Bytespeed is working with Ruckus. We're going to be offering some uh, aggressive discounts for, for E-rate projects, especially if uh, you're going to be upgrading from like, say a zone director to a new controller. There's uh, there's some special promos for that for E-rate. Um, so you can reach out to me, you know, if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, so for right now, um, let's see, we just have a couple questions. Uh, looks like E-rate uh, related. Um, so one second here. Uh, one person had asked, um, what's the best way for them to check their remaining balance that's available to them in E-rate? Uh, Jim, that might be a good one for you. Sure, there are two places you can go. You can go on to um, eRateProfitWorks.com, um, my our website, um, and uh, there's a Category 2 budget tool, or you can go to USAC.org under Open Data, and there is a, uh, under e -rate pro the E-Rate program under Open Data, and there is actually a Category 2 budget tool there as well. Um, look it up either way. All you need is your spin, or the, in our case, um, the name of your school district or um, library. Um, and uh, I'll take the second question as well. Is the management software under MIBS line meant to mean that you must be hiring someone else to manage the service? For, in so, for instance, could someone subscribe to PRTG hosted online? Um, it's a network monitor that can be hosted on cloud and self-managed. Um, so the only kicker is, is that um, PRTG would need to be registered under the E-rate program and supply that to you because the money has to flow to them, not to you as the, um, the uh, um, applicant. So understand that the service provider has to be registered with a SPIN under the E-rate program in order for them to provide it. If a third party is providing it, they would need to provide it. And typically, yes, it is for the monitoring, management, and operation by the third party of your network. Perfect. Uh, looks like another question just came in as well. Um, Jim, did, would you like to jump on that one? Sure. So category two budget dollars are what are called pre-discount dollars. So if um, you have the highest level of discount as an applicant at 85% for category two internal connections or those three legs of the stool, um, you would pay 15 cents on the dollar for that project. Uh, so $100,000 project, you'd have to come up with $15,000 in match. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, you know, if uh, I don't see any other questions or anything, um, I think we're approaching the hour mark. Um, so if nobody has any further questions, I think that could be it. Uh, Jatan, Jim, did you guys have anything else you'd like to add? Thank you for uh, your no, time I, and attention. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, li likewise, yeah. thanks for your time, folks. I appreciate it. I know it's, uh, this is a lot of information that uh, you had to digest today, but um, Hopefully uh, some of it was useful. And, and like I said, you know, you can always follow up with Aaron and he can get a hold of any one of us to uh, either answer questions or do a, a consult with you. Yes, for sure. I'll, I'll also send out a link to this, uh, this webinar to the video of it. Once it's ready, I'll, I'll get it out to everybody that's registered. I'll also send out some links, uh, uh, you know, to our guide that we've created um, also to a way that you can sign up for some uh, ruckus demos and a way you can sign up for some consultations with, with Bytespeed. Um, so I, I think if that's it, I think we could go ahead and, and call it good. Yep, thank you. Thanks thank everybody. You. Thanks for joining.